Well, good morning, everybody. It's half past 10, and it's time to start the service. And isn't it wonderful to be in a place where we can gather together, Man. where we Man. can hear from God's word, where we can praise God, and where we can pray to him. And what a blessing it is that we're allowed to do that in this country and just meet with our God. We we'll just pray that he'll meet with us. So let's just uh, bow our heads and open our time in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just come before you once again, and Lord, we're just thankful for some time that we can put aside, that we can think about you, that we can pray to you, that we can sing to you. Pray that you'll just help us today, pray that you'll work in our hearts, and Lord, we thank you for your love and your kindness that you show us, and we just pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 everybody welcome to church this morning and the first song we're going to sing is uh, entitled brethren we have met to worship may you all stand and we will sing all four verses brethren we have met to worship and adore the lord our god will you pray with all your power will we try to preach the word all is made unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you, slumbering on the brink of woe. That is coming, hell is moving. Can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? Moses' sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior, tell them that He will be found. Sisters, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely, let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners, still our God exalt things new. Then He'll call us home to heaven, at His table we'll sit down. Christ will greet Himself and serve us. All around. Thank you, you may be seated. The next song we're going to sing is I Will Praise Him. We will sing all five verses. When I saw the cleansing fountain open wide for all my sea, I obeyed the Spirit who it now be big clean. I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise the love for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away its stain. Though the way seems straight and narrow, all I claim was swept away. My ambitions and wishes, the feet and ashes lay as lay. I will praise Him, I will praise Him, praise the Lamb for sinners' name. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away its stain. Then, good 
Lord upon the altar. Oh, my heart was set aflame. I shall never cease and praise Him. Glory, glory to His name. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners name. Give Him glory, all ye people. For His blood can wash away each day. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I'm so glad it took me. He's forgiven my transgression. He has cleansed for me my heart from sin. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners' name. Give Him glory, all ye people. For his blood can wash away its stain. Glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit. Glory to the Peace One. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners' name. blood can wash away each thing. All right, welcome once again to New Beginnings Baptist Church. It feels like it's Welcome Home Sunday, right? You say, what do you mean? Uh, well, Brother Jerry's back um, from Townsville, and from what I understand, he's back back, like he's not going back, he's staying here. Uh, starting a new job, and uh, we're excited. We're glad to have them. And then um, I think, uh, yeah, the barbers are back. Yeah, they're back from their big trip, and ho- uh, heard a lot of good things about it. Kyle, I've heard you experience snow, right? Do you have snow? Yeah, that's fun. We were all hot here while you were in snow. We were jealous of your snow. <laughs> Although I don't know if I'd want snow if I had to shovel it again. But anyways. Um, glad they're back and uh, people getting back and settled back in and we're, we're excited about what the Lord's doing. A couple of announcements just to bear in mind. Um, next Sunday morning on the 30th, immediately following the service, ladies, if you could just meet with my wife uh, for a few moments uh, to make some plans. Uh, many of the families in the church should have got an invitation um, or folks in the church should have got an invitation as you came in or sometime on the, I believe it's the 18th of June, that Sunday. Uh, we're going to do a kind of a reception fellowship as part of a service um, for Brianna and Andy um, on that day. And uh, we're going to do it um, kind of like what we did for Justin and Natalia. So part of the service, part of a fellowship meal and all those types of things. And you'll, uh, ladies, you'll know more about that next Sunday as we plan that. Uh, but do, do try to make plans. We're going to be doing that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on that Sunday in lieu of the 5 o'clock service. Uh, so that way, if there are some people who don't go to our church that would like to attend that, um, they can and still be at their service that, that evening. Um, and so that will be coming up on the 18th, uh, I believe, of, of June. And then a few other things will be going on, and so we look forward to that also. I believe it's the, I want to say the 22nd of July, I could be wrong, uh, but whatever that Saturday is, uh, it's Super Saturday, and so again, if you would like to be involved in that and have a part in Super Saturday, we really need as many hands on deck as we can that Saturday morning uh, to be able to have a part in, in inviting the children and teens from churches and, and the community from all over and uh, to have a, a day. A uh, time where they can come, there's some Bible lessons and stories, there's some crafts, there's some games, uh, there's a youth rally going on during all that, and uh, we'll have three buildings on the property that we can use, so we'll kind of be spread out all over the place, the younger children will be down below, the, the teens will be up here, and uh, this is a day that we can just try to help encourage um, some young people, and so if you can make your plan to be there. Now, if you're going to be there, uh, we need you to have a blue card. Uh, so that way that you're approved to work with children and all those types of things. And if you don't have a blue card, 
but you'd like to get one, please see me. Uh, we can walk you through the process, help you get that. And so that way you'll have that be on hand and we look forward to that, that great time together. Um, and then one other thing, um, we've been praying about what to do with some of our extra missions money. And uh, we've mentioned it a couple times. I mentioned it on Wednesday night um, to, to the men that were present. And their suggestion was to put it to the church. And uh, here's what we'd like to do is in Vanuatu, you know, we're involved with Pursue Youth Camp, right? And uh, our church puts a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort into that youth camp being able to go on and do what we do for the teens here in Australia. And we have the opportunity, and this blows my mind, uh, for the cost of this, because we would never be able, we can't even hire a camp facility for what I'm about to tell you. Uh, to hire the camp facility for Pursuit next year in 2024 is $5,500 just to have the facility. That's no food, that's no games, that's nobody. That's just to have beds and buildings. That's, that's all that's for, all right? Uh, but in Vanuatu, uh, we can fully fund the youth camp for $1,000. That's it. And we have about $4,000 extra in our missions account. And so I, I mentioned to the, to the gentleman uh, after Wednesday night in prayer group and, and Brother Dieter, Brother uh, Brian, uh, Brother Pete, and I think um, Josh was there. A few others were there. And they all said, oh, that's a good deal. That's, that's good. So I'd like to say that we take $1,000 of that $4,000 extra and just fund the whole youth camp. Uh, so that way they have youth camp, the gospel goes out. Now, what Brother Jeremy said, he said, well, he's there. He's going to get Ishmael to put a report together for us of what took place at camp and all that. And even possibly a video presentation. So you'll be able to see the pictures from the youth camp and hear what God did through that youth camp. All right. And uh, so that's what I'd like. So if you're a member of the church, um, is all in favor to to give $1,000 to fund the youth camp? If you're a member, all in favor? All right. All opposed? Well, we just funded a youth camp. That's a whole lot cheaper than our youth camp. Um, I wonder if it'd be cheaper to fly our youth camp to Vanuatu. <laughs> or better yet, cruise our youth camp to Vanuatu. And uh, I'm going to have to look into that now. All right. Youth camp and missions trip all in one. Um, anyways... Uh, so thank you for doing that. We'll get that all arranged and set up and get the money to them um, as fast as we can. And uh, that'll be exciting to hear about what that. So we still have about $3,000 to help our missionaries with. So we'll still be in prayer and things are coming up. Um, and so we'll let you know what they are. We'll talk about them as we go. All right. So at this time, if you take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And uh, that's going to be the scripture reading this morning. And um, Brother Jackson's going to come up. And we say, welcome home. Come on back to work. No. Uh, <laughs> welcome home. And uh, he's going to come up. He's going to uh, offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the way God's providing for our offerings and providing for us as a church. And then he'll have the scripture reading for us this morning. So. Good morning, everyone. Oh, never get used to that. <laughs> Good to see you all again. Um, yeah, firstly, we'll just start off and, um, yeah, we'll just uh, pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, we thank you for your provisions. Lord, we also, we pray, Lord, that uh, your offerings, Lord, that you can use them for your kingdom, Lord, and the money that we, we gather, Lord, to get to our missions also, Lord. We just pray that these things be used wherever they need to be, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor said, we're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, 
and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of these a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Amen. Uh, may I give blessing on the reading of the Lord's word. Amen. Amen. Okay, the last song we're going to sing uh, before the message is uh, entitled Count Your Blessings. When upon life's below you are tempestos, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? As the cross seem heavy, you are called to bear. Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you with wealth and gold. Count your many blessings, money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven on your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God had done. On the last, so amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings and you will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey send. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. If your children are going to children's church, they can be dismissed at this time, along with the workers. Everyone else, if you take your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We've begun a new series on remaining focused, even if no one else around you is. And uh, sometimes we're looking at this idea of having one purpose, of love, uh, living justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. And sometimes when everyone around you is doing those things, it makes it a whole lot easier to do those things, isn't it? But if someone around you isn't, it does make it a little bit harder. And if you're living in a world that is nowhere near doing that, it does make it hard. So how do we remain focused? How do we remain focused on that one purpose? Uh, on living a life of faith. And so we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at what I've sort of entitled this morning uh, as a title of the message is Into the Unknown. Now, just by I'm watching reactions on people's faces, and I can tell who watches Disney and who doesn't watch Disney, um, but right off the bat I can make a few assessments there. It has nothing to do with the song, if you're thinking about that. It has nothing to do with that. 
has to do with what happens when your faith and your journey brings you into unknown territory. As I began to, honestly, as I began to, I've had the framework of this message uh, for some time ready to go and looking at it, but as I began to uh, go over it, um, have you ever heard a message, I don't know, have you ever heard a message that you're going through something and the message was exactly what you're going through? Well, how about you prepare a message when the message you're preparing is exactly what you're going through. And uh, a couple of times this week, I just had to say, okay, God, are you trying to tell me something? Uh, but anyways, we're going to be looking at this idea of faith into the unknown. Now, we all face, and I hate using this word because it's been overused now, unprecedented times, don't we? Now, we all face at some point in our walk with God things that are unprecedented, things that have, we've never gone through before. Well, maybe you remember how in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, the, the COVID pandemic, that word unprecedented was used everywhere, all the time, all the, uh, everywhere. And it began to really lose its meaning, yes? Uh, it's, it's hard to have unprecedented things happening every second of every day. I mean, we heard that word. Now, uh, for the first few months of that pandemic, the use of that word seemed to explode. And by the end of 2020, Oxford Languages was prepared to call it the word of the year. You know, they pick a word of the year every year. But um, what they did instead, and an unprecedented move, rather than having a word of the year, they decided they needed several words of the year to summarize 2020. And it released these in a report titled, Words of an Unprecedented Year. So they were going to make unprecedented the, the word of the year, then they did an unprecedented thing and had multiple words of the year because it was an unprecedented year. Now, pretty soon, unprecedented became so predictable that it lost its effectiveness. It was overused. And slowly, marketers began to use that word and and they began to relinquish that, that word and, and use other synonyms and all that. And even if we eliminated unprecedented from our vocabulary, do you think unprecedented things go away? Unprecedented times happen. We all face them. Whether it be a worldwide pandemic or a personal individual crisis. Can I tell you, there's no guarantees that our lives tomorrow will be built on things that we're used to and things we've seen for years past. Well, our hearts get burdened and really with things that are going on. And can I tell you something? It is hard in the middle of all these things going on in life to remain focused. And it's in the midst of these uncertain times that I think we can identify with Abraham and what he's about to go through in this passage of Scripture. No, God has not asked us to move ourselves to a place where we don't know until he tells us and take our whole family with us, most of us. But we can un that, that's an unprecedented thing to ask of someone, and we can identify with that. Now, Abraham lived around 1850 B.C., and he was the father of the nation of Israel. Now, at the start of his journey with God, the Lord made a spectacular promise to him that, we, that Brother um, Jackson just read. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless the, thee and make thy name great. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Can I tell you something? We've lived long enough to know that in Abraham, all the families of the world are indeed blessed because it's through his family line that we get Jesus Christ, who is a Savior who paid the sin debt for all the world and how you and I can now have our sins forgiven in a home in, with him forever, right? So that, that all came. That all came true. And at the time God made these promises to Abraham, Abraham was 75 years old and had no children. 75, no children. 
But he was going to be blessed. We were all going to be blessed from him. Other times we find that God told them that your children will be innumerable as the sands on the seashore. Have you ever tried to count grains of sand? Have you ever tried to count stars? You go out at night and you begin to count stars and then you're like, oh, what, did I just count that one or did I not that one? Then all of a sudden airplanes do a silly trick and they have those blinking lights. You're like, is that a star or is that an airplane? You don't know which one, if you count it a star, you don't know, it's kind of an airplane, and you just can't count the stars in the sky. Can you imagine being 75 and told you would have that many children, knowing that your wife, if he was seven, let's, let's do some math. I know you didn't come to church to do this, but if Abraham had, had the baby, had, had Isaac when he was 100, and Sarah was, what, 90? Yes? So if Abraham was 75, that would make Sarah, when she was promised to have that many children, children list, at 65. Do we ever think about that in Scripture? A 75-year-old and a 65-year-old are promised all these children, and you wonder why they went, huh? Well... Abraham started with, in what the Bible refers to as Ur of the Chaldees and modern day Iraq. And that was where he was born. That was where he brought up. They traveled through Haran, modern day Syria. And from there, they passed through Canaan to Sikkim. Eventually, they passed on to Hebron. And as Abraham entered the northern coast of Canaan, it's possible that he actually passed through what is known today as Abraham's Gate. That's why it's called that. And in the ancient city of Dan. And this gate is nearly 4,000 years old and was erected before the time of Abraham. But the amazing aspect of Abraham's life was not the length of his journey. Can I tell you, the amazing thing to me about his life was his faith. It was God's voice would come to him to lead him and that in response to God's voice Abraham would simply follow God. Okay, he says him this morning, faith is essential in our relationship with God. It is the very basis for even establishing a relationship with him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. If you're a Christian, it's because at one time in your life, you recognize that you were separated from God because of your sin, and you put your faith and trust in and what Christ did when he died on the cross was buried in the borrowed tomb and rose again the third day. Our salvation is by God's grace accessed through faith. Can I tell you something? That was true of Abraham as well. Although he lived 1850 years before Christ, both Old Testament and New Testament emphasizes that faith was the basis of a relationship with God. You say, I don't believe you. I think it's different. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 15 and look at verse 6. Speaking of Abraham or Abraham, he says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Hey, how did God account righteousness to Abraham? The same way he accounts righteousness to you and me. He believed God. He put his faith in God. How do you get righteousness applied to your account? You believe God. You put your faith and trust in God. Hey, we put our faith and trust that God sent Christ to pay for our sins. He put his faith and trust that God would send someone to be the Messiah. Difference, but the same. Not only is faith the beginning point of our relationship with God, but the Christian life after salvation is to be an ongoing journey of faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible tells us that without faith, it is not just unlikely, but it is impossible to please God. The need for our faith is good news for those of us who aren't strong enough, knowledgeable enough, or good enough to impress God. 
Hey, all he asks is for you to have faith in who he is and to diligently seek him. From Abraham's life, we're going to learn how to walk by faith in an unfailing God during unknown and uncertainty throughout all of life. Very first thing that we see about Abraham, what about his faith? Well, first of all, we see he had faith to follow. He had faith to follow. Not, I mean, we should follow his faith, but he had faith to actually follow God, to actually do what he asked him to do. What does it look like to follow God by faith? Well, Abraham will tell us. You say, what do you mean? The very first thing we see, in order to have faith to follow God, you must have faith that is exercised. Not faith that is just talked about, not faith that is just up here, but faith that puts the belief to action. So what, how? Well, there's no such thing, can I tell you, as dormant faith. For faith to be real, it must be active. Genesis chapter 12. Verse 4, God tells him, get thee out of thy country, right? What's he say? What ha what's verse 4? So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and a lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. That's a verse we often skip. We often look over that. That's just a fact that we have up here. But do you understand? He had enough faith in God that when God said, Abraham, leave everything you know, he said, okay. He could have sat there for years, right? Debating on the probability and the, you know, the, you know whether this trip was a good trip. Could I afford the trip? Will my wife be happy with the trip? What will my family do? Where will we go? Where will we live? How will we have a roof over our head? Well, back then it was easier to have a roof over your head because they traveled. They had tents and they traveled and they lived in tents and it's a little bit different than now, but do you understand what I mean? But no, he doesn't show that. I mean, now I, probably somewhere in his mind, let's be honest, if he's as human as we believe he is, those thoughts went on up here. But what happened? Verse 4, it says, he left. He packed up and moved. You say, what do you mean? He exercised the faith he had. God said, he had this relationship with God where God would speak to him. God said, move to where I tell you. Abraham said, okay, and did it. There's a difference between telling God okay and telling God okay and doing what God says. Do you understand? Oftentimes in our life, God will speak to us through his word and we'll be like, okay, God, I agree with you. I need to fix that. And then we don't do it. There's a world of difference there. That's not faith that's exercised. That's faith that's ignored. He had faith that was exercised. Sometimes we so complicate the Christian life that it becomes overwhelming and impossible. Following God is simple. We receive his revealed word and in faith we obey it. It's that simple. What is it? Obedience is the very best way to show that you well, to show that you oh, come on now. You've sung it before. You better say it or I'll make you sing it with me. Ready? It's show that you so you got to do something to show you believe. What's the best way to show you believe? Obedience. Simply doing what God says. Hey, Abraham was able to overcome the unknowns of life by obeying God one day at a time. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed God. And he went out not knowing whither he went. You know what that basically says? God's, Abram said, God, I'll put my faith in you and I'll obey you one step at a time. You've told me what to do today. I'll do today what you told me to do today. What about tomorrow? Well, when you tell me, I'll do that too. 
What about five years from now? Well, uh, when, you, when we get there, I'll, I'll do that too. But all too often, we won't do today what we know we should do because we're worried about five years from today. Well, where's that going to take me? I don't know where it's going to take you. Hey, never in my wildest dreams as a five-year-old little boy when I accepted Christ as my Savior did I expect that that, that decision would take me to Australia. But here I am, right? And here you are. It's simply obeying God. Hey, too often we approach the Bible with the attitude, God, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll decide if it fits into my plans for my life. That's entirely the wrong approach. Instead, we approach it with a commitment to obey before we even know what God wants us to do. Do you understand what I mean by that? It means saying as a Christian, God, I commit my life to follow you, and whatever you tell me to do, I'm telling you today, I will do it. You say, but what if you, you don't like what he says? I didn't say that. I said, if God tells me what to do, I will do it. Is that what Abram did? Yes. Abram, you're moving. Where am I moving to, Lord? I'll tell you when you get there. Really? Yep. If I were Abram, I would say, God, you want to tell my wife this? Because I sure don't want to be the one to tell her. But here's Abraham doing these things. Imagine for a moment what this looked like for Abraham and Sarah. Sarah, God spoke to me today. He told me we need to move. Okay, how far? I don't know. Like we're going on a trip? No, 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 no. We're packing up everything. And we're not coming back. Is it nearby? I don't know. Is it in the same country where we live? I don't know. I don't think so. Do they speak the same language we do? I don't know what language they speak. How will we know what supplies to bring for the trip? I don't know. We'll bring enough until we can get five more. How long will it take us to get there? I don't know, sir. All I know is that we're supposed to start moving, and God will tell us where to go and when to stop. Imagine that conversation, going home and having that conversation. Hey, walking by faith is not theoretical. It's action. If Abraham had stayed in his hometown talking about how much he loved and trusted God, he would have not faced the unknown, but he would also not actually be trusting in God. Faith acts on what it knows at that time. When you read through Hebrews 11, sometimes referred to as the great hall of faith, you'll find one person after another who walked by faith because they trusted in God. In fact, the phrase by faith occurs 16 times in that chapter. 15 of these times, it is attached to a person and a specific action they took by faith. You say, what do you mean? By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch was translated. By faith, Noah prepared. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Abraham sojourned. By faith, Abraham offered. You can go on and on. Isaac blessed, Moses chose, Rahab received. Do you get the idea? Faith reveals itself in action. So the faith to follow was faith that is exercised. It's also faith that is expecting. Faith is not only active, but it also expects something. Why did Abraham obey God? Because he expects God to fulfill his promise. He expected children. So many that the sands of the seas and the stars of the sky. He expected that through his family, every family in the world would be blessed. Why did he obey? Well, he trusted God, but he also expected something from God. Abraham's faith produced friendship with God. 
Abram was recorded. Look, this blows, look at Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. In verse 8. But thou, Israel, art, art my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, what's it say? My friend. It's God speaking. What do you call Abraham? Abraham, my friend. Ultimately, Abraham's expectant, action-oriented faith produced a friendship with God. Hey, as the Bible repeatedly teaches, friendship was based on faith in God and is the basis of Abraham's imputed righteousness. Hey, that's good news. You say, why is that good news? Because we who have also trusted Christ have the same imputed righteousness through Christ through our faith in Him. Therefore, if Abraham could be a friend of God, guess who else could be? You and me. Should be an encouraging thing. Abraham's faith in God was the basis for his friendship with God. And over the years, sometimes his faith faltered. And sometimes it lapsed. But over time, it strengthened. And in his walk of faith, God reached out to him as a friend. Repeatedly, Abraham, by faith, reached back towards God. And it was a daily journey of following God and cultivating a close friendship with God in his life. But also, this is what we don't like, as Abraham's faith resulted in the friendship of God, but Abraham's faith required patience. Required patience. When you look back at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, you'll see God made three promises to Abraham. He promised him land. He promised him descendants. And he promised him a blessing, yes? Yes. Well, think for a moment about the delay between God's promise and its fulfillment. There was the land. God promised him land, right? You know how long a delay it was before Abraham had land? 400 years. 400 years. That's a delay. That took some patience. Yes? Before his descent. The sentence actually had land. Hey, the son part, the, the, the children, the, that part, that was a 25-year delay between when God said this promise and God gave the son. 25-year delay. Oh, you know that one about him being a blessing to all the nations? That's an 1,800-year or more delay. Between the time God promised that to Abraham and the time God, through his family God sent Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world. A little bit of patience there, right? Now granted, do you understand most of these delays meant that Abraham, the promise was not fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. But Abraham's faith still produced an expectancy in what God would do. But it was through those years that Abraham learned that the blessing is the journey. It's not the item. It's the journey. It's not just receiving the fulfillment of God's promise at the end of the road. It's growing in our knowledge of and experience with God along the way. Hey, along the way to that 25 years to delay to have that son, God and Abraham journeyed down a lot of roads, and God taught Abraham a lot of lessons. And by the way, we're going to see in a few moments, Abraham passed some tests and failed some tests. And by the way, he's just like you and me. He failed one test multiple times. Have you ever done that? And God, here I am again. I know, I know you've forgiven me, and I know I've asked for forgiveness, but here I am again. 
You say, but he was a friend of God. Yes, he was a friend of God, but he was not perfect. We'll see that as we keep going. I do not know a serious-minded Christian who does not want a close relationship with God. I assume that most everyone here this morning that would know Christ as their Savior would want a close relationship with God. But here's the problem. Many of us want it instantly. We want it now. We want to see God's blessing the moment we first believe in His promise. We don't like the 25-year delay. We don't like the 400-year delay. We definitely don't like the 800-year delay. Why? Because in the 400-year delay and the 1800-year delay, I don't get it. In time, though, we discover that it's the very process of the journey with God that is a blessing in our life. Being able to walk with Him daily. Being able to see him work. Being able to see, hey, you know what? God asked me to do this, and I put my faith into work and action, and I did it, and look what God did when I stepped out in faith. Look how God provided. Look what, what God accomplished. Look what's happening now. Look what God's doing this way. So he, he had faith to follow. Second thing we see, he had faith for the journey. Genesis 12 tells us that when God called Abram to leave, he responded in obedience. So Abram departed, verse 4. He had faith to follow. The next few verses describe Abraham's journey as it continued through Canaan. And look with me at verse 9. And Abram journeying, going on still toward the south. You see, Abraham did not only have faith to start the journey, but he also had faith to continue the journey. You know, in your walk with God, you have to have faith to start the journey, yes? But just as much faith as you had to start it, you have to have to continue it. To keep the journey going. To keep walking with God. To remain focused no matter what else is going on around you, takes just as much faith as it does to start. And he had this faith, ongoing faith. You say, what was it? Well, it was a traveling faith. Abraham's faith didn't stagnate at the start of his relationship with God or his journey of obedience would have never happened. His faith continued to fuel his obedience and his hope. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and with Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Do you understand? Even when he got to the promised land, he still sojourned. Do you know in Abraham's lifetime, the only land he ever owned was in Hebron where he bought a parcel to bury his wife. Think about that. God promised him a land. And in the land, the only land he owned in his entire lifetime was the land he bought to bury his wife. I don't know about you, but if I finally got to where God told me to go, would I still want to keep traveling? No, I'd want to be there and see what... But you know what? He had the faith to keep going. Not only did he have a traveling faith, he had a tested faith. A tested faith. Look what happened in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. He's made the journey. He's finally got to where God wants him to go. And what's the first thing that's recorded when he gets there? Look at verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. Hey, Abram, you're in the land. Welcome home. Now there's a famine. Sometimes when it rains, it pours. Have you heard that phrase? I've been, but God, I've been obeying you. I've been walking. I've been on this journey. I had no idea where I was going. I still followed you. I still did what's right. I'm doing what you asked me to do. And now when I get there, 
wherever there is, there is a famine. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. You see, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Testing is not always easy. Testing does not always go how we expect it to. I was reading a story. The uh, U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has a testing tool. It's a unique testing tool. You, you may have read about it. You may not have read about it. They've got a cannon to shoot a chicken, a dead chicken, not a live chicken, so don't get upset. It's already dead, okay? A dead chicken out of the cannon at airplanes' windows to test them. And the velocity it shoots the chicken out is the same velocity as the cruising speed of the plane. So it simulates a chicken or a bird. You know how sometimes, if you've ever been on an airplane and a bird flying hits the, the, the plane? If you haven't, count your blessings. I've been on one where the bird didn't just hit the plane, the bird flew into the engine. And you smell this nasty burning smell. And you get to the, we're making a landing to be able to test the engine. And you go to the next airport and you, know, you say, why? Okay. So they had this tool where they shoot a chicken out at the velocity of a cruising altitude of an airplane into a windscreen of a plane to see if that windscreen will stand up to being struck by a bird while flying. And if it doesn't break, it's good. It goes in the, in the plane. If it does break, it doesn't. Well, um, England decided that they were going to build a super speed train. And they decided to ask the U.S. if they could borrow this chicken cannon. Because they wanted to test this, the, at, at high speeds, could this train's windows live up to the airplane standard? And the only way they could think to do that was they borrowed this cannon. True story, true story. So they did. They got the locomotive set up there, and they got the window in the locomotive. They aimed the cannon at the window, and they shot the bird, the, the chicken, dead chicken, at the locomotive window. And something happened that they didn't expect to happen was the test failed horribly. The chicken went through the window, through the, the, the conductor seat, and impaled the driving instruments, the top of the chair, and everything that's passed into the wall behind where the conductor would sit. And they thought, well, that didn't test it and go how we expected it to go. So they rang the administration and said, this is what we did. This is what happened. The window in that locomotive is the same as the window in the airplane. Why does the airplane window not fail, but this one fail? Here was their response. You probably should have thawed the chicken out first. Tests don't go how you expect them, do they? A frozen bird is not simulating a real bird that's, that you're going to hit in the air. And you know what? Sometimes in life we face those tests where God goes, well, thaw that out first, you know? It doesn't exactly happen how we do. Why does God allow our faith to be tested? Well, for one thing, Testing reveals flaws in our faith. It shows us where we're weak. Under pressure of testing, faith crumbles, giving the opportunity to turn to the Lord for grace and strength. It's one thing to say you have great faith. It's another thing to see that faith under pressure. Abraham encountered several kinds of tests on his journey. And some tests he failed. By the way, when he went to Egypt, apparently Sarah was a pretty attractive lady. And apparently, wherever she went, people took notice. You say, why? Because when they went down to Egypt, Abraham said, tell them you're my sister. Because when they see you, and if they know that you're my wife, they'll see you, and they'll want you as their wife, and they'll probably kill me to get you. So that's what she did. And what happened? Pharaoh went, ooh, new wife. Until guess what? God said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, why are you messing with another man's wife? 
And Pharaoh went, why'd you do this? Why'd you bring this wickedness? Here, take her, go. By the way, that wasn't the only time God, that Abraham told Sarah to tell that, that story. By the way, if you have a sort of lie, because it's sort of, you know, the fact that she was, was sort of kind of roundabout there. So he failed some tests. In a way, Abraham's failures of faith can encourage us almost as much as his victories. To see a great man referred to in Romans as the father of all them that believe falter during some of his tests can motivate us to hang in there and not give up when our faith is weak. What kind of test? He had test of truthfulness. Abraham asked his own wife to lie. Can you tell me, no Christian starts out with a desire to lose their testimony. It, when we encounter a test, we're sometimes more focused on getting out of the situation than we are on honoring God while we walk through that by faith instead. He also had a test of generosity. Another key moment in his life, Abraham and his nephew Lot are standing there. They're looking out. They're, they're both herdsmen, and their herds and cattlemen are becoming big, and they're having lots of them, and, and they're starting to fight over land. And Abraham and Lot are standing there looking out over the well-watered plains. And here's a test of generosity. And Abraham looked at Lot and said, Lot, it's not good that we're fighting. You choose the land first that you'll go to, and I'll have the rest. And generously, Abraham gives Lot the choice. And of course, Lot, if you're a smart herdsman, what are you going to do? You're going to pick the well-watered plains, yes? And off he went. And God began to make more, met with Abraham there, and he told them some things, and he helped them learn some things, and he, he had the test of generosity, and he passed that test. And God blessed him for it. He had a test of patience. We already said this at 75 and 65, they were promised their firstborn son. Ten years later, After God's first promise of the son, Abraham and Sarah lost patience. They failed this test. Hey, they lost patience and they made a plan to help God out. Have you ever tried to help God out? Somehow it just doesn't seem to help too well. And they helped God out and Hagar came into the picture and Ishmael came into the picture and that didn't turn out so well. Still, it hasn't turned out so well. Why? Why? They failed the test of patience. They decided that, oh, it's been 10 years since God. By the way, give them a little bit of slack. They're now 85 and 75. If they were 75 and 65, 10 years is 85 and 75. And can you imagine an 85-year-old and a 75-year-old not losing a little bit of patience when the promise is that they're going to have a child? Right? I mean, think about it. It seems to be a little bit of an impossible thing at a lady at 75 to be having a baby. But it was still going to be another 15 years before that promise came out. Abraham's failure led to a loss of fellowship with God. By the way, after Abraham and Sarah helped him out, it would be a 13, it would be 13 years from the birth of Ishmael until God spoke to him again. Did you ever look at the Bible and figure that out there? From the time Ishmael was born to the time God came and spoke to Abraham again was a 13-year gap. Have you ever gone through a time where it seems God's silent in your life? But he did. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her, 
And you know what he does? He gives him the promise again. Hey, Abraham, it seems you've forgotten the promise. So I'm going to give it to you again. Matter of fact, I'm going to give it to you again so much so in the way that I'm going to change your names to reflect the promise. If you look at the meaning of the names, it's been changed. Isaac's birth is a reminder of an essential truth to hold on to when you're facing the unknown. Nothing is too hard for God. Can God make a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old lady have a baby? Uh-huh. How do you know? Isaac. But that's not possible. Yeah, I know. But with God, all things are possible. After all, that's what he told Sarah. One of the very reasons that God sometimes allows delays is to work patience into our hearts and lives. Hey, why? The trying of your faith worketh patience. Hey, but let patience have her perfect way that ye may be perfect and tired, wanting nothing. Hey, don't short circuit the process of patience by fleshly intervention. God has not forgotten you. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Third thing is, not is only faith to follow and faith to the journey, but faith to sacrifice. Abraham, human as he was, was a godly man. Oh yes, throughout his life he, he made sacrifices for God. He, he left everything. But he also fell flat on his face sometimes. But he still was a godly man. And eventually, God commanded Abraham to make the ultimate sacrifice. We see in Abraham's life the ultimate request. In Genesis chapter 21, the Bible records that God did bring about the promise to give Abraham and Sarah the son of Isaac. Then in Genesis chapter 22, some years later, Isaac was an early teen, and God asks him to make the ultimate request, the ultimate sacrifice. Take your son, your only son. Bring him up to a mountain that I will show you and offer him to me there. So what happens? Abraham does what Abraham did throughout his life. His faith brought him to obedient action. He, some servants, Isaac, load up the animals, they go, to, they go on a three-day journey for the sacrifice. They go on up. The, the tells the service way at the bottom of the mountain. You know the story if you're familiar with it. It seemed Abraham learned from his previous tests of faith, and, and now this ultimate test, he obeyed immediately without question. New Testament gives us a glimpse into Abraham's response process. You say, what do you mean? Take your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, have a look into his response process real quick. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure you see Abraham's thought process was that God could raise up Isaac from the dead can I ask you something think about this where in the world did, God, did Abraham get the idea that God could raise someone from the dead? Nowhere in Scripture before Abraham has God ever raised anyone from the dead. You and I look at that and go, yeah, God can raise people from the dead. Look at the widow of their son. Look at, you know, the, this person's daughter. Look at this person. Look, look at Jesus himself. In our mind, we look back through the Bible and we go, yes, we believe God can raise people from the dead. Look at all those he's raised from the dead. But in Abraham's time, who had God ever raised from the dead that we know of? So where would he get the idea that even if his son died, God could raise him from the dead? I believe, he truly believed, God could do the impossible. How did he know God could do the impossible? He was looking at his son. 
a hundred year, some odd year old man in his hundred and teens was looking at this child that God gave him at 10, that along the journey he had learned some things. He had failed some tests, he had passed some tests, and in every test he had, he learned something new from God. Well, then we see the ultimate request, we see the ultimate sacrifice. Abraham brings Isaac up there, and he does what he was told to do, and God stops him. Could it be then that one of the reasons God leads us through uncertain times is that we may freshly look to Him? If hard times lead us to a fresh look and a refocusing on God and a renewed dependence on Him, then aren't they a blessing in disguise? Abraham had faith to follow God. Abraham had faith to journey on with God. And Abraham had faith to sacrifice for God. It was through faith, simple faith, that Abraham became the friend of God and received God's righteousness. Maybe this morning you've not established that relationship with God. You've not come to Christ as your Savior. Can I tell you, that's the greatest step of faith you can ever take is that first step of putting your faith and trust in Christ. Maybe today you're here and you're a Christian and you put that, that, step, that step to start your journey. Can I ask you, how's the journey going? How is that, that, that ongoing faith, not just to... To follow initially, but to continue on in the journey with Christ. To continue on in that, that journey of faith. Hey, in reality, God allows us to experience the unpredictable, the unknown, and even unprecedented times that we might experience blessing that we would never have experienced had we not gone through those things in life. He invites us to a life of friendship with Him. A journey of faith. And He promises that as we walk by faith, He will reward our faith. So can I ask you, how's the journey going? You say, but, but it's hard to focus. I understand. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. It's hard to focus. But can I tell you something? It's worth the journey. To walk with God and to see God do things and to remain focused. Hey, things are going to go on around you. The world's going to do some different things. But not everyone's going to love mercy. Not everyone's going to act justly. Not everyone's going to walk humbly. But can I tell you something? Those who remain focused will be able to experience things no one else did. By the way, Abraham saw God do all these things and every promise God ever made to Abraham, whether in his life or in the times to come, God has fulfilled every one of them. God can do the same for you, but we must remain focused in our journey with Him through every testing of life. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for Abraham and, and, and your word, and Lord, thank you so much for showing us someone who although they are known as a friend of you, although they are in what we would call the great hall of faith, will receive through your word they are just someone like us. Someone who passes tests, fails tests, sometimes multiple times. By and large gets back up and still walks in journeys with you in faith. Lord, we thank you that you are the rewarder of them that diligently seek you. We thank you that even when we are not always true to our faith and our walk with you, but Lord, you are always true to your promises to us. And I pray that there would be anyone here today who has not had that faith to follow, that starting faith in their life, to put in their faith and trust in Christ and in Christ alone. May they do that today. And Lord, may those of us who are on the journey with you may remain, remain focused and follow you through all the difficulty and all the different testings of life. And Lord, help us to be true with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. you.
all stand with me again and we will sing the last song for this morning entitled I Surrender All. Thank you once again for coming this morning. If you're here today and you're not Christ your Savior, you've not started that journey with Him, please see me. We'd be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can know that for sure. And if you're saved and not been baptized, please let me know. We'd love to arrange a time, figure out how to do that, but we'll do it and uh, get you baptized. And if you're saved and baptized and not a member of the church, speak to me about that. And we'd like to help you out with that. Speaking of that, um, we have someone who wants to join the church. Yes, uh, we met with Haley. We, she gave us her testimony of her salvation and baptism, and uh, she expressed a desire. She's read the Constitution and all those things, expressed a desire to join the church. That, that's correct? Okay, good. Making sure. Uh, nothing's changed in the, in, the, in the time since we met. All right, so I'd like to put to the church that Haley becomes a member of New Beginnings Baptist Church. Amen. All right, all in favor, say Amen. All opposed, same sign. Welcome to the family. And we're glad to have you. And again, if you're here today and saved and baptized and you've not joined the church that you'd like to know more about that, please see me. Be happy to meet with you, give you what you need to know, and that, have an opportunity to ask questions. And we're glad to have a new member of the family. All right. So uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Make sure you make her feel welcome. And we look forward to seeing you back tonight, 5 o'clock. Ladies, remember, next Sunday morning, immediately after the, the morning service, we'll have that meeting as well. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time again that you've given us to assemble together. Now, Lord, as we go from this place, Lord, may we uh, trust you in, in all that you've promised us, and may we remain focused on you each and every day of our life. Uh, may, Lord, our faith bring you great glory. And Lord, may we be able to be a testimony for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.